I've been talking about the hindrances, and the other day I talked about the hindrance of doubt, and I focused on one kind of doubt, which is doubt in the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha. There's another kind of doubt that can also get in the way of your practice. That's doubt in yourself. It sometimes comes when there's a setback. You've been trying and trying and trying and then suddenly trip over something. You seem to be back at square one, or worse than square one. And a voice comes up in the mind, maybe you don't have it within you to do this. And that's a voice you cannot listen to. Because the meditation is a necessary skill. There are a lot of skills in the world where you realize that you don't have the talent for it, and it's not all that necessary. So you let those skills pass. But the others you're going to need. And you have to work on them, no matter how talented you are. Part of the problem, of course, is our educational system in this country. They channel you very quickly into areas where you're talented. And they don't teach you how to get good at something where you don't have talent. And so you have to pick up these skills on your own. And one of the important skills is learn how to talk to yourself. And this fits in with the Buddha's description of how you get past doubt. It's the same as getting past doubt in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. You have to analyze what's going on. If your concentration crashed, okay, what was it? What tripped you up? If you broke one of the precepts, okay, what was the temptation? What was the mind saying to itself when it gave in? You have to watch out for that the next time around. And you have to think up a good response so the next time that that particular argument comes, you don't fall for it. Now, this means that there may, may be other arguments that the mind tries, and you might not be up on those. But you can't simply go on the determination, well, I'm not going to fall for that the next time. Because you haven't looked into why you fell to begin with. And if you say, well, it's not going to happen ever again, you're setting yourself up for another fall, and that gets more and more discouraging. And after a while, that sabotage voice, the saboteur inside your mind that wants to undermine your practice, will get more and more evidence that you can't do this, you might as well give up. But you've got to keep telling yourself this is a skill you need to work on. And even if you're not really good at it, it's better than not doing it at all. It's like moving into a foreign country when you're old. We have to learn another language. You're never going to get really good at the language at that age. But there's no reason to give up. You're going to be needing to use it every day. So you make two. And as you get more observant, you, sometimes you can get better than make do. But that's the important principle, realizing this is something you've got to do. Think of a John Fuhr. He was orphaned at age 11. His relatives put him with different monasteries until he finally got a monastery where the abbot wasn't cruel. He told some stories of some of the first monasteries he went to where the Abbot sounded really sadistic with little temple boys. So I finally got one where the abbot was kindly and saw that here was this kid who had no relatives, no property. If he didn't learn some skills, he was going to probably be looking at a life of crime. So I tried to teach him some skills. Tried to teach him music. Well, the music didn't work. I was going to teach him medicine. But John Fuing saw that if you become a doctor, you're at everybody's beck and call all hours of the day and the night. He didn't want that. And so as he got older, 
being around a monastery, you, you think the temple boys would have heard a lot of Dharma. Well, it goes in one ear and goes out the other until a certain age. And then they start listening. For him it was sixteen, thinking about karma. Here he, here he was, poor, without a family, nothing to support him. He told himself, I've probably got lots and lots of bad karma in my past. I really got to do something. So he made up his mind he wanted to ordain. So when he reached the age of twenty, that's what happened. And then he was disappointed. He started studying the Vinaya and the Dhamma and realizing that, that the Vinaya, as it was practiced in his monastery, was pretty sloppy. And as for the practice of the Dharma, nobody spoke anything about meditation. He felt something was really lacking. Finally, his second year as a monk, he met a John Lee, who happened to wander into Chandraburti. He went to listen to his talks, looked at his behavior, and was really satisfied. So he decided that's the life he wanted. It wasn't easy. He had to put up with a lot of hardships, but it was that realization this was a skill he had to work on. Because if he didn't have this skill, he wouldn't have anything. To try to have that attitude that no matter what, you've got to work at this. It's a necessary skill. And then look at the voices in the mind that would pull you away. Look at each of them. What's the argument they use? What's the argument this one uses? What's the argument that that one uses? How can you outwit them? Plan ahead of time. Think of that story of the, the medical school where they taught brain surgery. And they wanted to make sure they had good candidates. And everybody, of course, who applied for the brain surgery section had good grades, but good grades don't necessarily mean you're going to be a good surgeon. So they had to figure out what questions to ask in the interview that would screen the candidates. And it came down with two. One was, can you tell us about a mistake you've made recently? And if the ad candidate said, I can't think of any mistakes I've made recently, he was out, or she was out. But if the candidate did mention a mistake, then the next question was, how would you avoid that mistake the next time around, to see if this was the kind of person who would actually try to improve, would learn how to look back on a mistake and learn how to analyze it and see where was the weak point. And then figure out how to compensate for that weak point. Well, that's precisely the attitude you need as a meditator. When you slip up in the precepts, slip up in the concentration, let yourself get embroiled in the kind of thinking that is antithetical to the practice. Once you can pull yourself out, you have to ask yourself why. What was the, the weak point this time? Then you may trip again. But make sure you don't trip over the same tripwire. That's the important thing. So when doubts arise about your ability to do this, you have to remind yourself, I've got to do this no matter what. I may not be the most expert meditator or the most expert practitioner, but I've got to do my best. And it's one of those cases where you have to take your mistakes seriously, but not so grimly serious that they, you let them defeat you. Just go back and review what happened. And you may not like to see your weak points. But if you don't allow yourself to see your weak points, how are you going to solve them? You can't just push past them. Pretend they're not there, because they'll get you the next time around. Look at how you talk to yourself. 
And John Lee makes the point that of the various fabrications, bodily, verbal, and mental, the really important one is for verbal. Because it's through the way we talk to ourselves that we can destroy ourselves, we can sabotage the practice. It's through the way we talk to ourselves we can pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off, and encourage ourselves to move on. It's through the way we talk to ourselves we make our decisions. So learn to look at the conversation in your mind. Who's saying what? Who can you believe? Which voices are random? Which voices are in line with the practice? Which ones sound like Dharma but really are not? And which ones are out to get you? You have to admit to yourself that all these voices are there. And then you can figure out what to do with them. So as the Buddha said, the cure for doubt is not just to say you believe in yourself or doubt. Rock star written all over your meditation record. The way they try to give confidence to kids in school these days. It doesn't work. You need to have some basis for confidence. In this case, it has to be your determination that regardless of how good you've been in the past, each present moment is an opportunity to make a turn. Remember, the, the Buddha said the mind is very changeable. It can reverse direction quick, more quickly than anything else in the world. Now, sometimes that's dangerous. You're going along, things are going fine, all of a sudden you find yourself wondering if you want to practice at all. But there's a way in which you can take that changeability and turn it to your advantage. When you're going in a wrong direction, you can turn around. Once you start slipping, you're not committed to the slip. This is one way in which the mind gets you. you say, well, you've already slipped a little bit, you might as well go all the way. Turn that around. You've slept a little bit, well, you don't have to go all the way. You can stop. Just the intention to be skillful is in itself a skillful intention. And then you back it up, back it up, back it up. And the cynical voices in the mind will say, oh, it's the, you know you're going to give in again. Say, okay, I gave in to that particular voice that time, but I'm not going to give in to it again. Now, there may be other voices which I'm going to have to figure out. But try to go at this systematically. And you find that you have a better and better track record. And you can build some confidence inside that way. And this way, when you do slip, you don't have to slip very far before you catch yourself. You don't have to fall down into the chasm of doubting your ability to do this at all. Jump over the chasm and keep going. 